Hello, everybody. I'm Ann Hogan. I'm Dean of the College of Communication and Fine Arts here at the University of Memphis. And it was my great pleasure to welcome you today to the second interview in our series entitled Professional Reinvention. I'll be speaking today with Rachel Knox. Rachel is a graduate of our theater program here at the College of Communication and Fine Arts. She received her BFA in theater in 2011 and went on to receive her master's in public policy and administration from the American University. Rachel has had an amazing impact supporting cultural organizations and artists here in Memphis. She's worked with the Orpheum Theater, with Innovate Memphis, and since 2017, she's worked as a senior program officer with the Thriving Arts and Culture portfolio for the Hyde Family Foundation. Rachel is overseeing the distribution of $2.2 million in grants funding to Memphis-based cultural institutions, and she's had a particular focus on working with organizations led by people of color, and she has increased funding to those organizations quite considerably. Rachel has been rightly recognized for her work. She's received the 40 Under 40 Urban Elite Award, and in 2020, she received from the Memphis Business Journal, the 40 Under 40 Award. It's my real pleasure to welcome Rachel Knox. So it is my really great pleasure this Monday morning to introduce to you Rachel Knox. Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Of course, I'm so glad to be here and have this conversation with you. Yeah, no, it's awesome. And you know, I was thinking when I was going through all of your incredible accomplishments and wow, but you know, the, the 40 under 40 Urban Elite Award and the Memphis Business Journal, the 40 under 40, I was kind of thinking like 40 under 40, people to watch, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no pressure at all. Just a little bit of pressure. <laughs> Well, I want to come back to what comes next, maybe down, down the line for, for Rachel and your just really incredible career. And I think quite an inspiration to our, to our students and particularly our theater students. Um, as I mentioned, you graduated from our uh, BFA in theater. And so maybe we can start, Rachel, tell me a bit about going back to, we graduated in 2011, so it must have been 2008 or around there that you began the program yeah. wow yeah. wow that was uh, <laughs> that was also i'm like having a crisis because i realized that i've been out of school for like a decade at this point <laughs> yeah well we don't really ever let you go you know so you're still you're still part of the big family but what was when you think back if any i can't think past the previous week but if you can think back that long um yeah. what were what were what what drew you to the program and what were you hoping to achieve through it and what were you thinking about what you were going to do with your life way back when when you were uh, <laughs> thinking about being a student with us absolutely so i applied to the theater program because i i knew i loved the arts and i was um always kind of like a, a theater kid, but one that wasn't as involved in theater as like some of the others. And it, I, I really just wanted the opportunity to explore what life could be like. And so I started as a performance major uh, in, at the theater school. And um, because really I, I didn't know that there was more to it because a lot of high school theater, you know, like you rent costumes, you know, dads build the sets right. or those are rented. So you don't really realize there's like a whole other world that it takes place behind sure. that. So um, my freshman year, first semester, we all had to take, everyone has to take uh, introduction to technical theater and introduction to performance, um, regardless of your concentration. And I took the intro to design course and fell absolutely in love with it. And, yeah. I, remember, <laughs> and I remember going to my advisor at the time and I was like, um, hey, I don't, I don't think I want to do performance anymore. Um, can I switch to tech? And my sweet advisor was like, well, sure, but do you have like technical skills? And I was like, no. <laughs> but Not I like that. Not I'm yet. willing to learn. Exactly. Yeah. And so 
Wow. So I want to make you switch. switched. You did. Okay. Yeah. And, but that's really interesting because I think that so many times, you know, students come to the University of Memphis or other universities and they might not even know what major they want. But once you exactly. get into an area, there's still so many facets of it to explore. So, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. did you stay with the technical side of things? Yeah. So I will say one of the things I appreciated the most about being at the University of Memphis was um, the opportunity to take risks. So it was a risk for me to switch from performance, something that I knew to design, which I, I didn't know. Um, and the professors were all just exceptionally generous and gracious and, and helped me to really navigate that new space. Um, so I was, you know, going along in costume design and technology, and I, I loved it. I loved working on the shows, loved working with um, the grad students and all the actors. And then, like, as I was, like, working in the costume shop, I was, like, always the one who was, like, talking about current events and always, like, up in arms about something. And then I realized, I was, like, maybe I actually... I don't want to do the art. <laughs> Maybe what I really want to do Not is good. to make sure that artists have the tools they need to do the art. And so um, I think it was like my senior year, we took introduction to theater management. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to manage the art so that the artists can vision cast and do all of their exceptional work. And there are people behind the scenes ensuring that they have everything they need to do it. So I graduated, of course, with a technical theater degree, but spent um, really all four years of school working in basically arts administration for Voices of the South Theater Company here in Memphis. Right, um, and right, really right. And really enjoying yeah. that and getting to work with Alice and Jenny. Um, and yeah, time it's a wonderful. Time. So, yeah. yeah, so it was really nice to have the space to explore um, and figure out what I actually loved and what I was actually passionate about. So that's really interesting that that kind of aspect of which obviously you've you've you know evolved from incredibly in your career kind of was was more it sounds like towards the latter part of your journey and your degree as it you was were yeah and I think that's why I enjoyed like this opportunity to explore I had four years to figure it out and had even within that four years multiple opportunities to like really build the craft of arts administration and you know audience right. development which wasn't something that I realized I could do until I was able to apply for fellowship at arena stage in Washington DC and I had all of this experience that I was just like oh no that was a fun thing I did they're like no you can get paid for this this is like an actual job <laughs> that you can do <laughs> That's about, so I was gonna say, the next step in your in your education was to uh, get an MA in public policy and administration. So that's at the American University in, in yes. Washington D.C. So that was a bit of a risk too to go. Although it sounds like you were you know you were finding out towards the end of your degree program with us that this is what you wanted to focus on. So so why D.C. and how did how did that go for you? Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of interesting um, because I am a person. The exploration, I think, is the theme of my life. Uh, so I, uh, after I returned from Arena Sage, I worked at the Orpheum Theater for four years in their education department. Um, got a chance to really work with a lot of schools in Shelby County and um, surrounding areas in Mississippi and Arkansas. And I ran for city council during that time and got really oh, into oh, <laughs> Did you? So you were, yes. yeah. I, I, wow, you've, you've just always had such a, a civic, a sense of civic responsibility driving. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, wow. And it was funny because a lot of the, um, a lot of my uh, friends that I went to school with who were there at the same time were like, oh, that makes sense because you were always yelling about politics in the costume shop. So <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was like, you guys got the very earliest version of Rachel Knox. So <laughs> that's really interesting because that was always a part of you that was yeah. that, that it sounds like just was able to to develop and evolve and but so this was this is before you went to study your master's program is that yeah is so that, that was before yes and then I left the Orpheum Theater and I started working at Innovate Memphis 
um, which was uh, a part of the Bloomberg Innovation Cities grant. And so I got to work on a lot of uh, stuff around blight mitigation and remediation and just like really policy oriented things. And I was like totally in my element. Um, I was like, I'm gonna go get my master's degree in public policy administration. But what was funny was like, I always got put on projects where artists were involved. So <laughs> like they, we, um, before the Confederate statues were taken down at uh, now Fourth Bluff Park, um, I was a part of like working with musicians and artists to like help to activate the space and do Fourth Bluff Sundays. And I'd like, worked on, I was on a panel to, to help uh, a neighborhood uh, select community art and public art for their community. And so I was like, I feel like even though I have this through line that's like policy and politics, right. like the arts keep pulling me in regardless. So I was like, I need to find a balance of those two things. So I was able to finish my degree a couple of years ago while I started my work here at, um, at uh, the High Foundation. Oh, that that's incredible. So did they kind of did they know about your background there or do you just kind of exude that creative, you know, uh, connectivity? <laughs> yeah, I think um, as you can tell from the dress I'm wearing today, like this is how I showed up in the office and everyone's like, I feel like she's an artist, right? Or she does artsy things because no one else in government is dressing like that. So. <laughs> doing our costume department exactly i was like yeah <laughs> and um yeah but that that kind of in in well first of all tell me tell me about your 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 master's program so you so you were you were working with the hyde foundation while you were pursuing your degree yes so oh. i mean i oh, love memphis <laughs> anyone who knows me knows i love memphis with my whole heart um, I am a firm believer in nothing but Memphis. And so I was like, I actually don't want to leave Memphis to get my uh -huh. master's degree. Um, and I had a friend who um, at the time worked for Just City and she had just gotten accepted into the AU program. And I was like, oh, so I can do both of them. It was insane for me to be working full time while also getting a master's degree online, but it worked out. <laughs> so, um, and then I got to go. Yes, I got to go physically graduate in DC. So it was, it was good. Wow, that's amazing. So then I, one, one thing that I wanted to ask you about, given that you've, you know, took your grounding in, in theater and the technical mm -hmm. aspect of theater, but then your interest in, you know, in equity issues and, and local politics and all of that, what, what, how are you able, because you've been able to obviously success, very successfully negotiate and navigate your, your career. And so what was it, the parts of the theater, obviously you're working with arts organizations now, but what yeah. were some of the skills that you get from a degree in theater that kind of allowed you to translate those and be able to or transfer them and be able to use them in your career? Absolutely. I mean, I really think that both the performance and the technical side of theater really equipped me very well for the workforce, um, whether I was at the Orpheum or Innovate Memphis or now at the Hyde Foundation. I would say, um, obviously, regardless of concentration, you have to work with people, which is like the job, right? Like most people don't get to just like work by themselves and never have to interact with other people. And so, um, so much of my job right now is very people focused and it's very mm -hmm. much about how to negotiate the needs of the trustees and what their wants are and what we need in the arts and culture sector and really finding creative ways to do that work. And that's all I did when I was in technical theater was trying to find creative ways to work inside the lines, to work outside of the lines. And I don't think that I would also be as flexible a person if I hadn't had the opportunity to really work with people with lots of different types of personalities and right. communication styles. And it served me really well. And I think what has been um, the most interesting about it is that uh, I didn't realize it was a skill until people started pointing it out uh -huh. to me because it was so right. ingrained in how you have to work in theater that people were like, wow, you're really great at like negotiating that kind of sticky situation. I was like, oh, really? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, oh, I guess 
I've always had to because of theater. And that was how I like started my career. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that, I mean, I think in that is, is that's so inspiring, I think, for our students to hear, to recognize in that, that, I mean, you were able to kind of connect the dots of your skill sets and look at how they could work in the, you know, in the broader um, uh, professional sector. But it's interesting that, yeah, I mean, in, in when you look at it now and I see your, you know, your your work at, at Innovate Memphis and at the Hyde Foundation, it almost seems quite obvious that those skills would be applicable, but right. yet not really maybe when you're a student and how that, you know, I mean, it also, yeah, so that's... Um, that's really fascinating. And it's also interesting to me how some of the people around you that you were working with recognize that yeah. as well. Yeah. Right. And it was really funny because I do feel like working in the arts and especially the performing arts, you, you also um, are constantly, it feels like you're on the clock. Like you, you know, you have like a set time when you have to get things done, you have to memorize your lines, you have to open and all of these things. So I, I also realized like I moved faster and differently from other people. So I remember oh, I was put on this research project and I like did my research, which of course I was like used to doing research because of theater. So I was like, I'm like, if I can find like how to copy this very specific color dye for a costume from the Renaissance, <laughs> I think I can like call the public works director at LA and set up a Zoom meeting. Like, I don't think that <laughs> that's gonna be very hard for me. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? It, it sort of, it sounds like it gave you the confidence to be able to do those things to realize, yeah, I actually, I know how to do oh, that. Yes. Yeah. Like deadlines for me are like hard targets. Like if there's a deadline, I'm always working backwards because you know, that's what you're trained to do. Like, you know, you have to, you know, have this piece of costume or, you know, these lines memorized by this. And so right. I think it has also helped me to function in a different way than most people yeah. where like, it's like, oh, we have this, wiggle room whereas in theater you do not have wiggle room <laughs> like in sink or swim right, right. you must go on right. <laughs> but yeah but you know i think it's 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 really it's really interesting of how um how those the, the actually thinking about particularly the research aspect that you mm -hmm. that you mentioned and i think that you know um really I, I always feel like study your passion mm -hmm. at, as, at, because if it's a good program, and of course all our programs are absolutely the fabulous. Best <laughs> they, will, they will give you, they will provide you with those skills in, in you know, the critical thinking skills, but also the capacity to do research. And I think what, what the, when you were talking about how you kind of discovered that you had those skills, I was thinking that when we talk about research, and of course there are more kind of straightforward aspects of research you're on a program, project and you know and you're going but actually research I mean if someone's studying a character or a play is from a certain period of time or as you say you know how do you look at precedence for the costumes and the, and right. that, so it's interesting that that thing concept of research is actually kind of what artists do is they're putting a working on it yes. and it's such a it's such an important skill in the workforce regardless and I think because it's so innate to like what we do, people don't realize like you have this very valuable skill right. that people would kill for. And also like, I feel like the tenacity, like I feel like artists um, are, are just gonna stop at a sim simple Google search. Like they're in the archives, they're like digging deep, they're talking to people. And I, I really love that because it's um, a pursuit of knowledge that I feel like other areas don't often deal with in a way that like artists are like, no, I don't have enough information. I need, I need more information. This is good. This is a good starting point, but I need to go deeper. <laughs> and I really love that okay. about working with artists and creatives. Well, I think that's, it's interesting because I think that, you know, so much of what drives artists in, in, in my experience is that that sense of curiosity, mm -hmm. you know, and really, and, and I think of the, um, yeah, not really being satisfied and, and perhaps it's because that, that the arts, you know, at least perhaps one aspect of what the arts are about or do is, is showing different perspectives and how do you look at something differently? So you're always kind of wanting, well, let me look at this differently. Let me find out a little yes. bit. More, you know? <laughs> exactly. But, 
can I ask you, so looking at the, the Hyde Family Foundation and mm-hmm. all of your work in, in, in securing grants and, and your focus on arts organizations, this is this may be an impossible question to answer because I suspect <laughs> that every day in Rachel's life is different. But could you give us a set, like, you know, I mean, it, it maybe a lot, what, what do you actually do, Rachel? What's yeah. a day in the life at the Hyde Foundation like for Rachel Knox? <laughs> oh my gosh, I love this question because as you said, like every day is different. So right now, um, December 1st, we just had our new grant cycle. And of oh, course, right. uh, this is our first cycle that we've reopened to folks that we have not funded before because we did um, close it to just folks that we'd funded previously during uh-huh. kind of like the height of the pandemic. So now we've reopened and now our arts and culture sector has taken a beating during this pandemic from closures and false starts and openings and stuff like that. So right now, I am deep in the very uncool work of reading (laughs) grants from about 20 really wonderful and very different organizations across the city and um, have definitely killed like three reams of trees for like all of the (laughs) grants that I'm reading through right now. But it's for a good Um, cause, it's for a good cause. (laughs) Yes, so we're doing that, but then um, a lot of what we do at the Hyde Foundation is called Sleeves Rolled Up Philanthropy. That's what our president, Teresa Sloyan, always says. And um, we really believe that our job isn't just to write a check, and then move on. Um, We want our relationships to be deeper and the less transactional. So we also spend a lot of time in the field. I have the really fun job because most of my evenings are filled with exhibitions and shows and plays and musicals and um, all of these, you know, dance concerts, all these wonderful um, artistic and cultural feats that are occurring across Memphis, which I absolutely adore. Um, But then during the day, I also get the opportunity to work with others and dream um, a bigger vision for our philanthropic sector. You know, what does it look like to uh, work more intensely with the Kresge Foundation out of Detroit? What does it look like to um, support individual artists and to ensure that they have the safety nets that they need to um, be able to survive? And so um, every day is different and it's a lot of fun because it it does stretch, I feel like, the uh, boundaries of kind of my thoughts and what is possible and what is impossible. And um, I think one of the fun things um, about working in my job is that um, very few things are impossible, but some things just take a little longer. Than oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. You say that again, that's really, that's, that's cool and yes. inspiring. <laughs> Yes, we found that very few things are impossible. Just some things take a little longer than we would like. <laughs> what a what a great approach to you know to that. And I think that. And by the way, I want to because I know that this is a particularly intense time of your cycle and and your work. So that being the case, I am quadruply grateful to you. For oh, <laughs> I wouldn't have missed this. <laughs> But let's, I mean, I, I clearly, and, and you're really, I mean, I think what's so um, exciting about your position and, and it, you know, it could never get boring is that you really are, you have your finger on the pulse of so many, you know, different types of arts, yeah. genres and, you know, yeah. from exhibitions to concerts and all of that. So let's talk about um, in terms of artists and arts organizations and, you know, and trying to survive, frankly, through almost two years of, of the pandemic. And just, I mean, it, it, it's been just so traumatic for, yeah. for, for the arts. And, um, and I think that at the same time, um, you know, artists don't give up and, and the art goes on. But what, what are some of your observations about, you know, the arts organizations and artists that you're working out of how they had to um, if they were able to 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 deal with this incredibly uncertain time and um, and you know in the closures and having to find different ways to be able to connect with their with their audiences. Absolutely. Well, um, I really love what you just said around like artists they don't stop, and I think that was what we saw initially. 
um, not just in Memphis, but I mean, nationwide, globally, of artists who were still creating um, while all of us were in our houses. They were hosting virtual concerts and, um, you know, doing drive-by concerts and, um, and painting and, and writing poetry and, and creating all of these modes of expression that kind of uh, really captured how we were all feeling. Um, and it really struck me that these people who are these culture bearers in our communities and do so much to really create the culture and identity of a city, um, we're still doing their work for free, right? And so one of the things that we are trying to push and we is the Hyde Foundation, as well as um, several of our intermediary partners um, across the city of Memphis. So Arts Memphis, Memphis Music Initiative, and um, Music Export Memphis um, are really trying to use this moment also as an opportunity to uh, reimagine what our cultural sector needs to look like and how we support individual artists. Um, I think too often um, arts and culture have been looked at as icing on the cake instead of the ingredient in the cake. I always say that um, arts and culture are the eggs. We bind everything together. Oh, that's <laughs> that's um, and part of that is really um, focusing on how do we pay artists A, what they're worth, but to ensure that it is um, happening across the community. And right now, I would say that the artists that are struggling the most um, are musicians, just because of who, who Memphis is as a community. A majority of the artists in Memphis are musicians. And that's not to say that you know dancers or visual artists or um, other types of writers, other types of artists aren't struggling, but we know that um, the pay for musicians has not changed since the 1990s. We know that um, musicians are, you know, struggling to make ends meet like other artists, but they're also at the mercy of for-profit venues that have also been unable to open. Um, and so therefore they're not getting paid anything. And so one of the things that we did was we launched um, a recovery and resilience fund uh, that was dispersed by Arts Memphis and Music Export Memphis. And they were able to give out between 2020 and this year over half a million, close to um, a quarter of a million dollars of individual payments to um, artists of which 70% were musicians, but dancers, painters, visual artists, um, graphic artists, all were a part of uh, that bucket. And they were so grateful to have this money that they could get to, but all of them were like, thank you so much. But also, do you know when we can get back to work? And <laughs> we're like, we're well, crying. <laughs> Right. No, that's no. And, 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 and your work and with Arts Memphis has done a just a fantastic job yes. in, um, in uh, with the the I'm actually the um, acting director of our Institute for the Arts and Health. And we're working yeah. with Arts Memphis now too to kind of look at that's that wonderful. issue. But yeah. also, um, and it was something I wanted to get your your thoughts on as well about, um, you know, the the economic hardships, but also the the mental health issues and the yes. anguish that, you know, and I think that there's, and when I said that artists never stop, they don't, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been easy oh, yeah. and traumatic. And I think that, you know, that it, and I, what in, in terms of, in, um, you know, with, with, with music and, um, and here in, in, in the college and with the Woody Scheidt School of Music, I mean, it was, Incredi it was incredibly difficult for, for the entire college, but the specificity of each area. And of course with, yeah. with musicians, it's the droplets. And I remember at the beginning of COVID and just trying to, you know, yeah. and that being the case, I've been to some concerts recently and um, of choral, you know, our, our choral ensembles yeah. and opera program and all our musicians. And it's like, wow, you can like project with a mask on and, yeah. you know, and, and there's, <laughs> There have been those adjustments, but it's been so much longer and and more grueling than anyone yes. could have anticipated. So how do you, um, well, I guess, first of all, what, what are some of your impressions on those hardships and how the economic also can really do a toll, um, you know, in terms of one's mental health and well-being as well? And, and kind of what, from your observations, what, what do we need to do 
at this point moving forward to really make sure that the that the arts thrive? Absolutely. I mean, the mental health piece has been a constant source of conversation um, across all of our portfolio areas. So the High Foundation, um, in addition to arts and culture funds in the areas of education, um, vibrant spaces and communities, so our neighborhood level work, and then um, education and civic narrative, how we talk about um, leadership and civic narrative, how we talk about ourselves as a city. Um, and all of those areas for different reasons, of course, are dealing with you know, mental health and burnout and um, all of these things. I mean, education right now is, is hemorrhaging teachers um, because uh, it's just been so difficult and they've had like a very different um, set of issues from our artists and our artists are, um, you know, I think a lot of artists are empaths and they're feelers. And so they, they really take in what's happening yeah. in the world and that takes a toll on people as right. well. And when, you are unable to even do your work, you know, that is a different level um, of, of, of hardship and struggle that uh, has to be addressed in a very different way. And so one of the things that we are also focused on um, with our, our group of intermediaries is also how do we make um, mental health services accessible and affordable for mm -hmm. our artists as well. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, a lot less of a stigma around like, you know, finding a therapist or talking to someone and things like that, but lots of times people right. can't afford it. So is right. there a way that we can also create space and have resources so artists are able to go see people and process what they're feeling? Because as you said, it's been a marathon, like nobody has had a chance to breathe and say like, okay, now I can start to do the, you know, other part of my work or pick up where I left off. And so we're, we're carrying all of this baggage while we're also being forced to just like be people and also be expected to create and also be expected to like maybe have a job and then a new variant comes out and then things shut down or people cancel shows because they want to be, you know, safe, which I think is so important. But at the same time, like it's a lot of up and down for anyone to manage and any spaces that we can create for artists um, to really be able to process that will also allow them to create fully. I don't believe that yeah. artists have to suffer to be able to create. And certainly no, not. It's, it's, the the way we can, <laughs> it's, it's not an exactly. Anyway, it's, it's interesting because um, as part of our strategic planning process in the college, I've been meeting with you know lots of faculty and staff and students as well. And and one of the things that it's precisely what you've been you know um, uh, calling attention to is that we are far from out of the woods, and here we are with a, a new variant. But it has been. Um, kind of one crisis after another. Yeah. So the fact of even trying to process mm -hmm. the, the huge transformations um, and some of which might end up being quite positive in the new right. avenues that we have yes. to explore. But I think that one of the, and that we've had some um, fantastic conversations with colleagues in the, colleague, in the college is, you know, how do we kind of learn to thrive in uncertainty and, and, you know, and, and the burnout as well as what you yeah. were, you know, what you were talking. Now, do you think, I mean, I, I, I um, find often, not always, but, and as someone who I'm a, I'm a former um, dancer, well, I guess you're never a former anything. So I'll say yeah. I'm still a <laughs> okay, of that, but um, there is, you know, for so often, I would say that artists don't look at their work, their art, as a job it's it's their identity you know and I think yeah. that how does how does that factor into the way that you're working and I and I think that it's so fortunate for the artist to have someone like you at the Hyde Foundation who's empathetic and really empathetic because you've you've you're you studied yeah. art, you're an artist yourself yeah. you know some <laughs> of those processes but you know when you were saying about how um, it, 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 that artists kind of can um, absorb things or their sensitivity or their that, how do you, could you just elaborate on that? And the question of how artists, um, it's not like, here's my art out there. It's like the art often is, this is me. Right, exactly. Yes, you're exactly right. And 
that so the Hyde Foundation has been funding um, since like the 1960s. So we have some organizations we've literally been funding for 40, 50 years um, at this point. And then we have this new cohort of younger organizations that have maybe only been around the last five years or so, or they're kind of like reaching another level of maturity in their nonprofits. And a lot of them are practicing artists too, who are starting this work. And so that was um, something that we really had to work with them on because it's really hard um, all the time, I think, to be a person and to have anything that you do be rejected, right? And it's like doubly hard when it's like your idea, your your sweat equity that went into it and you present it to someone, they're like, oh, no, thanks, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. That's really hard, right? And so um, we were really fortunate to fund a lot of folks like kind of at the beginning of their pursuit uh, for more philanthropic dollars. And our process, of course, is like very familial. We're like, you can do it. We love you. We're so excited to like, work with you. But like, we've had to like have conversations. We're like, okay, you're about to go into a different environment. And, right. you know, it's very much like, do you meet these criteria? Like they don't want to hear your story. They're not interested in your sweat equity. And like, how are you processing that? How are you divorcing your worth as a person from this work that you've created that is still wonderful and brilliant, but might not be something that they're seeking to fund right now. So what's, and, what has the response been of, I mean, how is that something that is difficult for some of the artists and the organizations to kind of uh, adapt to that kind of separation between, you know, the, the real personal investment of identity and, and the way that this kind of a fiscal decision about here's the criteria. Right. Yes. No, it absolutely has been. And um, there's a couple of organizations I work with really closely and we have a running joke. I don't know if you remember the Key and Peel skit where um, there was Luther, the Obama's anger translator. Um, but that's like my job sometimes uh, because like, uh, I'll introduce yeah. and like the person's not getting it and, and like the person that we're trying to introduce is getting really upset. And I'm like, what they're trying to say is. <laughs> You're a translator. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, and it's always really funny when we debrief because they're like, okay, now I have some language for when I am like really upset about this thing. And I'm like, yes, because that is kind of a part of this work is being able to talk about yourself in different ways to different people. Yeah. Right? right. And I think that's something that I really learned at my time at University of Memphis because I might be able to explain, like I'm a very word-driven person. So with other word-driven people, I could be like, here's what it is. Let me just talk you through it. With other people, they're like, I need pictures, right? So then I need to make sure that I had like visuals for those people. So being able to kind of do both at the same time and understand how to like show up in space is something that was like a soft skill that I did not realize I got um, at my time at the University of Memphis until I got out to the working world and I was able to really, uh, you know, more effectively pivot between people who had different communication styles as well. Well, that's 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 really fascinating. And again, I think that of, uh, you know, kind of the recognition for you when or the realization when you were out, at, you know, working that, oh, that was actually like, that's just not part of my day and working to get a production, you know, on stage, but that's actually, that's, that's, yes. that's a, an employable skill that exactly. is that yes. in the marketplace. Yes. And yeah, but so just looking and, and from your um, experiences working with the artists, but also, I mean, you're out there attending everything and, you know, and, and really understanding it at, the, at that level. How do you think some of the adjustments like you know doing things on zoom or other formats and all of that and we've had to do that in all of the you know the, the visual and performing arts programs here at the university too i guess number one how um how successful or what what things might be the keepers in terms of, of what we've had to adjust in terms of covid and oh my goodness my phone just went off <laughs> um I'm sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> I thought 
actually had everything ready for the interview, but forgot to put the phone on mute. So, um, no yeah, the, so, you know, what are some of the things that you think were more successful? And um, I know that no one has a crystal ball, but how do you see the, the arts evolving um, in, while we're still in the midst of not quite knowing, you know, what the uncertainty of this new variant and where we're going and, and what might really be there for the arts. That's sure, yeah. And I like also just want to like use this question to um, allay fears too. Like I know that this has been brutal on artists and arts organizations, but there's been a lot of really excellent work that has come oh, out yeah. of the pandemic. Oh, yeah. And I don't want to highlight the negative and not uplift like what is going absolutely right right now in our ecosystem. So I will say that one of the things that has been, I think, game changing for a lot of organizations is this virtual platform mm -hmm. and the way that organizations like I think also um, you know, Zoom and other things have also gotten better at like how you can use them for productions. Um, and I would say that like folks who've done this really well um, have been Hattie Lou Theater, Casa Teatro, and um, Opera Memphis of the folks that we work with. Okay. Um, Hattie Lou was like one of the first organizations to reopen. Um, and they had everyone in like boxes. So you bought a box with your pod that had like was covered with like plastic and like you stayed in it. And it was great yeah. because you could still see a live performance. Um, and then they also later would stream those performances for people who weren't able to go because their ticket sales were, um, you know, not as high. So they made sure that there was lots of opportunity to reach people both in person and virtually. Um, Casa Teatro, which is um, our a Latino um, uh, theater group here in Memphis, they're doing amazing work. They have literally reached thousands of people through their virtual performances wow, and wow. have been able to like put themselves on the radar it's people you know in in the state of Tennessee and Mississippi and Arkansas like people who wouldn't be able to come here who huh. are like tuning in other places nationally with large Latinx populations have been able to um, tune in and it's made Memphis a leader because of the pandemic, which is wild to say that like <laughs> this, this made it easier yeah. for them to reach new audiences, but it's true. And um, Opera Memphis, who is like one of the companies I absolutely adore, uh, they were the first people to perform outside. And so they had this sing to me performance. They were in every single zip code in the city of Memphis. They would come yeah. out for schools, for birthday parties, just for fun. And they really made it accessible to a lot of people. And I think the thing that I hope we, we pull out of this pandemic is accessibility to the arts. Because I feel like, um, and this isn't just in Memphis, but in, in so many places, the reason um, the arts are seen as the icing on the cake is because only a certain level of people are able to access, mm -hmm. access the arts. Um, easily. And what the pandemic has done is taken down those barriers. So people can see all sorts of stories and things that reflect them and new stories about things that maybe don't reflect them, but reflect the human experience. And I think that's important for us to keep. And I think a lot of organizations are being very thoughtful about how they continue to do this work and ensure that both people um, who have access and opportunity are able to reach it, but those who don't, that there's still ways that they can engage with the art. And I think yeah, that's, 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 that's a really, really important um, uh, you know, issue about the accessibility. And I think that we, we have learned so much. And I think in, in, um, in the college, for instance, some of the performance that we've had um, uh, on and exhibitions too, because we, we you know, put those on digital formats and film them. Yeah. Um, that they have been able to reach more people and, um, but in different ways often, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, and I think that, do you find that, that that's something that, oh, well, maybe, you know, you don't actually, you can be in a theater, but yeah. you don't have to be. And there's still, you know, and, and, and it's still a really meaningful way to engage with it. But I think it's, 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 it's a lot that has changed in terms of, yes. you know, of, of, of the way we make, art, different kinds of art and the way that it's disseminated. And yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. And the that... way, oh, sorry. 
No, I was just, I was just thinking, like, how about from the audience's perspective, what have you found about people who maybe, you know, had never seen a performance at Hattie Lou, but now they see it and it's, yeah. it's, you know, maybe not at the theater in Midtown, but, but in a different way. How, how, what's, what's the reception been like in your experience? Oh, it's been outstanding. So I think one of the things that was really unique also is our dance company. So especially Collage Dance Collective in Valley, Memphis. Um, they filmed all of their productions and it yeah. wasn't just like a camera set up while people dance. Like they filmed them like film productions that highlighted dance. And that took a long time and a lot of thought, but it made the experience richer for audiences. Right. And so what we saw were people who had maybe never seen the Nutcracker, because that's what the ballet um, filmed last year, who were all of a sudden able to like share it and be like, oh, wow, I feel like I'm at the Orpheum and we're like curious as to how they could like get there next year. And so it also just made it, um, I think also emboldened people because it made them feel like it, it took the barrier of like, oh, this is scary and maybe I don't belong and I don't know what this is about. And what it said was like, this is it, watch it in your house, whatever that looks like. And if you would like this year, we're gonna have it at the theater and you're invited and you know what the story is. And, you know, and I think audiences have been like really excited about that because it's taken mm -hmm. some of the mystery away for people who maybe have not experienced the arts in that way before. Yeah, right, the mystery and also the intimidation, you know, if yes. you've ever, I mean, as I, I, you know, I didn't have much experience as, as, as um, growing up of being in theaters and, and, and yes. the first time I saw Nutcracker I was in it actually but you know but so I, I understand that. that of like oh what do I you know when do I clap how do I you know right. um, just, yes. actually, it's this is this is the the theaters are houses for everybody but but you're the way that that you your perspective on it is you know you can you can have that experience with it kind of in your own comfort zone in your house yes. and, and and then you're going to maybe feel you know more comfortable coming we found that in in terms of bringing um school children and young people on to yes. you know it's yes. like you already feel like oh this isn't this isn't scary but I do mm -hmm. think that some of the 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 new formats and the way that you know and and as you quite rightly say is awful it is as it has been it has kind of stretched the um the framework within you know which artists are working and we had um one performance that I just thought was terrific I've been so blown away by the creativity and resilience you know in in our arts community and and yeah. which you know the colleges is, is is part of but our our dance program when we weren't able to be inside at that that they had a site specific piece that was on um, uh, drawing on the history and, and history of race relations in, in Memphis, but it was also filmed. And so you kind of walked from different places to the campus and kind of went around and had this journey. And then if you weren't there that day, you could actually take your phone and walk it and then see the, the film of it. And I, I love that. That was something that I, it was really cool. It was, yes. it was really, um, you know, it was really amazing. And, um, but so do you think then that as we move forward, I mean, from, you know, one takeaway I have from from your um, observations about this is that the act audience actually may have grown, you know, yes. and, and so so how do we capitalize on that and make sure that, you know, yes. moving forward, what do, what do you think? Well, I think that's the million dollar question. And yeah. I think that's what all of our cultural organizations are um, really thinking through right now. And, you know, we're starting to see some organizations who realize like they had this much bigger audience, but maybe their audience couldn't get to where they are. So a lot of organizations are also thinking about like, okay, how do we maybe produce fewer shows in our building and maybe get out into the community? So we have the opportunity to ensure that everyone, you know, has access to the arts. And I think for other folks, they're really looking at um, how do we continue to integrate technology and yeah. to um, make it, you know, even better than what we did during the pandemic where everyone was kind of testing? How do we continue to grow with all of these new opportunities and new technologies? And I think it just provides like a wealth of excitement and experiences for future audiences and current audiences, because I mean, 
for me, I can't be in multiple places at once. Unfortunately, clone technology <laughs> has not <laughs> gotten us where we need to be. So um, sometimes, you know, yeah, I hope so <laughs> soon. Uh, because I hope, you know, that um, if I'm not able to attend one thing and I have to make a decision, um, that I'm still able to partake in this other artistic experience because it's recorded or because I know it's coming to my neighborhood or my grandparents' neighborhood. And, um, and I find that really exciting because it also ensures that you have more opportunity for people to engage with your your yeah. asset. And it, and it takes the idea of competition away, you know, of like, oh, you know, like we have to like make sure that everyone comes to our thing, even though these other things are happening, because, you know, people can say like, oh, I can technically see all of these, but it doesn't have to be in real time. <laughs> well, on my, on my time. Yeah. And I think right. it's interesting because I think that you know, trying to even think back to when, when you know, the 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 arts world was struggling with all of this, and uh, and it was yeah. kind of like, okay, well, now we have to do things, you know, on on video using other perform, you know, other formats, and when it's all over, we'll go back and and do things, and and that's really changed. Like, yeah. first of all, we we're not going to go back. I mean, the world has really, you know, changed. Yeah. But oh, those kind of worked. You yeah. know. Those, that, that, that's, <laughs> But one, one in in looking at you know the 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 um, really that intensity of change that artists and art organizations had to to wrestle with and and some of the solutions that they're still in the process of finding one aspect of that because I think one thing that I, I is so impressive about your work at the Hyde Foundation is how you increased funding um, to cultural organizations led by people of, of color and and your work in this field so what do you think um, for better or worse has been the impact of of this whole you know the pandemic this area of turbulence that we've been living through on those organizations um led by people of color or artists of color actually yeah well i i would certainly hope that um this isn't a phase philanthropically that people are like giving to organizations by black and brown leaders because they you know, feel bad about the racial unrest that's happened in the country because that's not helpful or useful. Um, it's not a, a productive emotion, right? And so what we know is that our black and brown led organizations have been severely undercapitalized for decades. And there's an opportunity for us to really double down on our support and support these organizations and support them in scaling up. And so um, one of my favorite organizations um, is Tone Memphis. And uh, if, if folks aren't familiar with them, definitely look them up. But uh, Victoria Jones, who's the founder and executive director of Tone, which uh, is a, a consortium for Black artists of all disciplines, but especially visual artists, has partnered with um, James Dukes, who is the producer for Unapologetic, and the two of them were able to purchase uh, a piece of land in Orange Mound um, that used to be the United Equipment Building. It has always been a landmark in Orange Mound, um, and they're called the Orange Mound Tower Project, and they are going to create a multi-use uh, space that will have um, uh, space for a visual artist space, producing space, uh, uh, um, rent controlled housing that's for oh, that's folks who live in Orange Mound, um, and then space for black businesses. And we were one of uh, Tone's first funders when they didn't have a space. And because of our grant, which wasn't significant by any means compared to other grants we gave, it was super significant for them because it helped to stabilize them in place mm -hmm. so that they could dream on this huge trajectory. And so they've received money from the Kresge Foundation, from uh, Restorative Economic Justice Fund, and they've been able to do this work and they're off like a shot. And it's it just shows you if you're able to invest in organizations and give them a chance and also yeah. get out of their way because we're not prescriptive with our grants. We're like, here's the money. We trust that you know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, you can incredible. see how it just really takes off and how you can continue to enrich in the culture of Memphis by placing a bet on people who reflect the majority of Memphis's population. That's 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 that is really it's so 
inspiring so many levels and and I love your you know what you've what you've um, highlighted there is the need to trust organizations that yes. they can take something that they can grow it from Absolutely. and you know and they're there they are the the experts in their vision obviously and that's yeah. that's that's amazing well we're um wow Rachel we're gonna have to do like part two and part three and so <laughs> forth because there's so much to talk about but I know that um, we're, we're almost um, incredibly running out of time. Oh. And I took it back to, you know, all these um, uh, incredible awards and 40 under 40 and all that. What, what do you see um, as, as what might be next? Or what, what are some of your aspirations in your career? Or is it, do you just approach it kind of organically? I don't know, however, you know. Yeah, you know. I mean, I... So when I was in undergrad, I was that person who always had like a five-year plan. And um, <laughs> every year I was there, the five-year plan got trashed and I had to start over again with a new five-year plan because there was something, a new opportunity that presented itself. And I feel like after I started working at Innovate Memphis, I was like, you need to stop making the five-year plans because clearly... Uh -huh. <laughs> like you are letting life happen in all the best ways and getting to explore the full um, breadth of opportunities. And so I think for me, I um, am just really excited to continue to explore. I hope that I'm able to fund more organizations and bring new funders along and continue to help grow um, Memphis's culture and help move it forward and continue to help Memphis be a city um, in the 21st century that is doing amazing work and is supporting visionary artists across the board. Well, I have, I have every confidence that you're going to be able to do that. Memphis is so fortunate to have you as, as, as its advocate and, and, you know, and someone who really really understands you know the 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 incredible art scene here and its and its needs so um this is amazing i'm just i'm just there's so many <laughs> other things that we need to unpack at at another time but thank you so much rachel this has been um just so insightful and i think that um this this is this is so incredible, I think, for artists and for our emerging artists in, in, in our programs here at, at the college um, and in programs that are maybe not um, the more communication focused. I think that what you've said in your approach to your career and and the versatility that you found in your, you know, in your education and your studies here has just been really so inspiring you're this is thank you so much thank I, you. Uh, i'm very grateful to you and thank you um will you come back and have another follow-up co conversation <laughs> oh absolutely i mean I, everyone knows me i could talk about memphis and memphis culture forever you might like have to physically remove me from the conversation in the future <laughs> <laughs> well we'll have to do that like i said the Memphis is just an extraordinary place with an extraordinary arts and cultural scene. And, and you are, you know, you are a, a hugely impactful part of that. And, and, you know, we're, we're lucky to have you in this city. Thank you for all Thank you, you do. You. Thank you so okay. much. Appreciate it. Take care, Rachel. And more and on, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Do I need to stay on or should, should I exit? <laughs> I think, um, 